I once gave a director a blowjob in order to get a part in a play. <laughs> Turned out I was the only fifth grader who even tried out for the part. <laughs> oh, buckle the fuck up. It's gonna get way worse. In my opinion, stand-up's the most kind of pure performance art. I heard someone behind me say, 911. That is the most adorable conspiracy theorist I've ever seen in my life. If you're playing music, you have an instrument. If you're some other kind of artist, you have a medium that you work with. Stand-up is just you standing on stage and, uh, you know, explaining, explaining what you think is funny in your head. When my wife and I opened the Comedy Attic in September of 2008, there had never been a full-time comedy club in Bloomington before. A lot of the success that we've had has just been because, you know, we we have like a relentless a attitude about making the shows good. So over the summer, uh, my stepson was obsessed with making slime. You guys, you guys know about this? Heard of this stuff. Like we had to buy so many supplies, he made so many messes, he broke so many dishes, ruined so much Tupperware. It was so annoying. And I was complaining about it to a woman at work. And she was like, uh, well, at least he's not taking drugs. I thought, you know those aren't his only two options, right? <laughs> Everything starts with what I think is funny. And then, and then as you write bits, especially longer ones, you, the audience, you start thinking about the audience when you realize you've got a big gap in between what's funny and, and the next funny thing. So then you start, kind of dissecting that to figure out what the funny is in between there. It's not either make slime or take drugs. Right? Like a third option that comes to mind for me is not taking drugs and not making slime. It's actually the option I've chosen. <laughs> I really like to do offensive jokes, uh, but the one thing that I learned um, from very early on was you need to be funnier than you are offensive. I used to be a flight attendant and guys would have to often ask me, they'd come up to me and ask me where they could have sex. And I'd say there's really only two places because I don't do anal. <laughs> there's a super small percentage of people who know anything about comedy who would say that you can't tell a rape joke. They're like bloggers that don't really matter. They're people that like don't, no one should be told they can't tell a joke. But the question that no one seems to be able to answer is, is why would you want to? Why do you want to tell a rape joke? Why do you want to make someone feel bad that they're a certain race? Like, why do you want to make someone feel bad that they're in a wheelchair? Like, what purpose does it serve? Why is it so important to you to go out of your way to make light of someone for something that they just simply can't change. You can't be exclusionary, which a lot of comedy scenes have a tendency to have this core group of white males um, that it's hard to, to break into that. I'm the only gay person I know of in my family, but I'm definitely not the gayest person in my family at all. <laughs> Like if my brother was standing here next to me, you guys would be like, who's that fag standing next to the homosexual gentleman? <laughs> there are people who are getting opportunities now, especially with like Netflix specials and Comedy Central specials, who would have been ignored their entire careers in the 80s or 90s. Um, and it's just, it's good to see that kind of variety because there are, you know, if, when we do open mics, if it's just 10 like straight white comic guys nothing ever really stands out you have to be so much so funny like it's hard to even as a I, I don't like it as a because you just get lumped in with everybody and nobody stands out and you want that variety you want to be in a show that has you know uh, people of color gender differences you just it makes for a better show I'm, I'm sorry, but I love how you were like, I get lumped in with just like all these white guys. But it is And like, true. I'm just like, we're all the same. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. Like, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> it was just funny. I'm not complaining. I'm just pointing out what. I yeah, know. Okay. He's not wrong. Yeah. I just found it humorous. You know, the epidemic is just booking any straight, straight white male comedian because 
that's what people think is funny. You can change anyone's mind of what they think is funny just by showing what you what you want on stage. We'll leave you this. Uh, I recently made the worst mistake of my life. Uh, I took a trip with my entire family, and we drove from Indiana to Florida. And a lot of people don't realize that when you drive from Indiana to Florida, you go through five states. Um, anger, bargaining, <laughs> depression in Georgia, which is the worst of all. <laughs> now we're starting to, like, pinprick the bro and like deflate that a little and like oh you think that you know just kind of narrow it take it down a notch or two or kind of mock it and so people who are more diverse more clever i think are getting their time to shine right now the future thing is just going to be more inclusive just like everything else you're going to get more people from all sorts of different backgrounds um, all sharing their perspectives and it's going to be less tolerated when people are exclusionary and they keep people out. That's what's gonna be maligned, I think. So it's just gonna become more and more diverse um, and more and more different people telling dick jokes. Like, I feel like I wake up and it's dark and I get home from work and it's dark. And I know theoretically that we get eight hours of sunshine during the day, just like I know that theoretically Dave Britton has a 10 inch penis, but like, I'm tired of the theory. I just want to see it. I want to bask in its glory, and I want to feel it on my face. 